Well, good afternoon, everyone. We appreciate your being here for what I think is the third in our series on Montana history and nine more easy lessons. Um, I would tell you what next week is, but I can't remember, so you're just going to have to come back and be surprised. Um, anyway, this today, two, two things of business before I forget. So over here on this table, we have a sign-up sheet. If you're a teacher and you're doing this for OPI renewal credit, you want to be sure and sign that one. If you're not on our weekly list of email reminders and you want to get emails about the programs here at the Society, there's a separate list for you to sign up on, and so uh, be sure and do that after the program. My name is Kirby Lambert. I'm with the Outreach and Interpretation Program here, and it is my pleasure to introduce Vic Ryman, who for 17 years was a museum technician here with the Historical Society. And he's one of those people that even though he retired last December, we didn't really want to let him go. Uh, so we're gonna, we made him come back and do this for us because he's, he's talked about the history of guns and the history of cattle ranching in various capacities for the society before and he always does such a great job. Um, we wanted to make him keep doing that. Uh, he is a native of Missouri, grew up in Great Falls. He um, attended the University of Montana. And there's other things I know about him, but he said I couldn't tell you. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Vic Ryman. Thank you, Kerry. I'm going to sit since I'm retired now. <laughs> well, thanks to you all for coming. Thanks to Kirby for the kind introduction. The days of the 19th century cattle herding in the Montana open range are romanticized today with iconic images of longhorn cattle, of cattle barons, cowboys, and rustlers. I first got really interested in this era about 25 years ago when I read Teddy Blue Abbott's fascinating memoir, We Pointed Them North. However, I had my personal introduction to the fascinations of cattle herding in the mid-1950s when I was only three years old. My family lived on a small farm in the Missouri Ozarks, and one day our neighbor's bull somehow got out of his pasture and came on over to our place. My mother looked out to see my sister and me following close behind the big animal. He was noted for his surliness. We were pelting him with stones to drive him back home. My mom put a quick end into this activity, but I've always remembered the thrill of my sister and me herding that huge animal the smell, and the flies. <laughs> I just wish we'd been big enough to saddle up our old prince, our percher on gelding, to really do the job right. Now, as you can no doubt tell, I love to reminisce about my days as a pint-sized cowboy. But I have come here this afternoon to talk about the origins of the Montana cattle growing industry from its genesis up through the tough times of the hard winter of 1886 87. In little more than 30 years during the mid-19th century, the Montana cattle industry grew from modest beginnings in the southwestern and western valleys, expanded onto the edge of the Great Plains, then exploded to stock and overstock nearly all the eastern prairies, only to nearly collapse after one terrible winter. The story of the rise and fall of this open-range cattle industry is a tale of short-sightedness, and greed, but also of great courage and resourcefulness. During the mid-19th century, a major corridor of migration, then commonly called the Emigrant Road or the Overland Trail, was pioneered west from the Missouri River across the Great Plains with branches going all the way to the Pacific Ocean. The middle section of the Emigrant Road crossed through what's now southern Wyoming and Idaho with a major branch going into northern Utah. Along this wagon road traveled persecuted Mormons seeking sanctuary in the Salt Lake Valley, as well as California gold seekers and settlers, also pioneers bound for Oregon. Many of the travelers herded along with them purebred English-American type cattle, particularly shorthorns, which were also called uh, nearly interchangeably Durhams after their close relative. 
Shorthorn and Durham cattle had been scientifically bred up in Northeast England during the last quarter of the 18th century. Shorthorns are unique in that they were dual purpose cattle, that is the shorthorn cows were good milk producers, but the, the breed also produced excellent beef. I'm sure you can appreciate why these dual purpose cattle were especially valued by settlers seeking to establish beef and dairy herds in their new homes in Oregon, California, and Utah. The emigrant road travelers' shorthorn cattle and their descendants would become vitally important for stocking Montana initially in the 1850s and 60s, and then again in the 1880s. By 1850, a new freelance livestock trading industry had developed along the emigrant road especially in what's now southwest Wyoming and uh, South Idaho near Fort Hall. By the time the emigrant travelers reached this part of the road, many of their cattle, horses, oxen, and mules had lost weight and were foot sore from walking nearly a thousand miles from the jumping off places on the Missouri River. And this is an actual photograph of an emigrant road cow. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe this one is. Bartering for these animals, and especially for the jaded cattle, became a lucrative business. This independent cattle trade was especially attractive to former mountain men and to their sons, who had been left without their regular livelihood by the decline of the beaver trade. Typically, an emigrant road cattle trader would initially acquire a small herd by swapping trade goods or something else of value to the travelers for their worn-out cattle. The trader would then rest and recuperate these cattle on good pasture somewhere away from the road, where forage had not been eaten down by the grazing of thousands of the passing animals of the pioneers. The cattle trader would return to the road the next year to trade his rejuvenated cattle to the passing emigrants in exchange for their spent cattle. A typical transaction was for a cattle trader to receive two of the emigrants' run-down cattle for one of his fit animals. By repeating this cycle, and by the cattle's natural increase, a trader might build up a herd of several hundred animals in only a few years. Now, one emigrant road cattle trader was Captain Richard Grant, who for a time in the 1840s had been the chief trader of the Hudson's Bay Company trading post at Fort Hall. That's uh, just to north of today's Pocatello. Grant left the employ of HBC in 1850 and began independently trading along the emigrant road. Sometime in the mid-1850s, Richard Grant moved his family, which included his sons James and Johnny and their families, along with their cattle herds to winter in the Beaverhead drainage of what's now southwest Montana. The valleys of southwestern and western Montana were perfect for rejuvenating cattle from the emigrant road over a winter because of their lush grasses and abundant water. In the fall of 1857, James and Granville Stewart, returning from California, diverted north from a branch of the emigrant road in what's now southern Idaho to avoid being caught up in the Mormon War. Granville Stewart's autobiography, 40 Years on the Frontier, it was published posthumously some 60 years later, it described the Stewarts' entrance into what is now Montana. We crossed the divide, and a wonderful change appeared in the country. Instead of the gray, sagebrush-covered plains of the Snake River, we saw smooth, rounded hills and sloping bench land covered with yellow bunch grass that waved in the wind like a field of grain. So, sounds like a cattleman's paradise. A beautiful little clear stream ran northwest on its way to join the Missouri River. And the Stewarts followed this stream and eventually they came to the headquarters of the Grant's cattle operation near the confluence of the Stinking Water and the Beaverhead Rivers. Now, everybody knows where the Stinking Water is. Anybody want to say? <laughs> it's, the, it's the Ruby River. They, they were near Twin Bridges. Granville Stewart reported that wintering with the Grants were a handful of other emigrant road cattle traders, all former mountain men with their families and their herds. 
Granville Stewart described the Grants and Associates cattle operation. When we came to Montana, the Grants and Jacobs, excuse me, the Grants and Jacobs had herds of several hundred cattle and horses. The cattle fattened on the native grasses without shelter other than that afforded by willows, alders, and tall ryegrass along the streams. In the spring, they were fat and fit for beef and were driven back to the emigrant road and traded for more footsore and worn out animals, which in turn were driven back to winter in Montana, the favorite places being the Beaverhead, Stinking Water, and Deer Lodge Valleys. So by the early 1860s, there were established herds of high quality English American type cattle with a large degree of shorthorn blood in the Beaverhead, Deer Lodge, and also the Bitterroot Valleys largely through the agency of Grant's son, Johnny, who in 1862 began building the large ranch house which still stands at the Grant Coors Ranch historic site outside of Deer Lodge. All that was missing for a Montana beef boom was for a nearby population of hungry beef eaters. Times were about to change dramatically with the arrival of thousands of beef-starved gold miners. So let's fast forward for a moment to follow the emigrant road cattle that made it all the way into Oregon. When the American settlers arrived in Oregon with their cattle in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s, they discovered that the English had already established small herds of a unique type of crossbred cattle to, to provide beef for their residents. The English had initially transported California longhorn cattle from California to the Oregon country by sea in the late 18th and early 19th centuries to provide a source of beef for the settlements at Nia Bay and at Nootka Sound on Vancouver Island. These California longhorns were descended from cattle the Spanish had brought to the New World and were apparently nearly identical in appearance and habit to the more familiar to us Texas longhorns. Later, the English also brought in purebred Durham bulls to grade up their herds and amorous encounters between the free-roaming California Longhorns and these Durham Bulls produced a blended trait <coughs> stream of cattle. On the fenced pastures of the Oregon, or, let me try that again. On the unfenced pastures of the Oregon country, the genetic heritage of the newly arrived American pioneers, largely shorthorn cattle, commingled with that of the English mixed blood Longhorn Durham cattle and this resulted in a new type of bovine that was extremely hardy and also yielded high quality beef. By the early years of the 1860s, there were large herds of these so-called Oregon cattle on the open ranges east of the Cascades where Oregon, Washington, and Idaho now adjoin. In the 1860s, Oregon cattle would become another source of high quality beef to feed the Montana miners. And Teddy Blue Abbott estimated that nearly half of the cattle brought in to stock the eastern Montana ranges in the 1880 were these Oregon cattle. The arrival of thousands of gold seekers into western Montana in the early 1860s created a huge demand for beef at almost any price. In 1862, a young Danish immigrant, Conrad Kors, came to what's now southwest Montana in search of gold. Kors took a job as a butcher for wages and helped to establish a butcher shop in Bannock after scrambling to obtain a scale, a saw, and a steak knife ground down from an old Bowie knife. <coughs> Within a short time, Conrad Kors, in addition to owning several butcher shops, also became a very successful cattle dealer and purchased animals from Utah and the Columbia Basin to augment the supply of available local animals. In April of 1865, Coors bought a drove of cattle that had been brought in from the Shasta Valley of California by the partnership of Philip Poindexter and William Orr. In his uh, also posthumous autobiography, Coors mentions that stock cattle were, were herded into Montana from as far away as Missouri to provide beef for the miners during the gold rush of the 1860s. In 1866, Conrad Coors purchased the ranch with large house at Deer Lodge from Johnny Grant, who was leaving the country. <clears throat> 
course, would go on to become an open-range cattle baron, even surviving and prospering after the hard winter of 1886-87. Now, in late 1866, Nelson Story arrived in southwest Montana with a herd of perhaps a thousand longhorn cattle he'd purchased in central Texas and had driven north. And it's commonly believed that these were the first Texas longhorns brought into Montana. And I'd highly recommend that you read John Russell's interesting article on this event in the winter 2019 issue of Montana, the magazine of Western history. It's available in the bookstore. <laughs> near, the, near the end of their more than a thousand mile cattle drive, Story and his men moved their cattle north through eastern Wyoming on the Bozeman Trail at great peril to themselves and to their cattle and against the wishes of the U.S. Army. The Bozeman Trail ran north from the Emigrant Road in eastern Wyoming to the gold fields of Montana. And the trail ran through unspoiled Indian hunting grounds in the Lakota Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho under the leadership of Red Cloud, waged a successful guerrilla war to close the trail and the three army forts that protected it. The Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868 closed the Bozeman Trail. By the treaty's terms, white incursions into all of central and eastern Wyoming, north of the North Platte River, were forbidden. The Indians quickly burned the Bozeman Trail Army forts to the ground, which was sort of a celebration barbecue, I suppose. <laughs> Nelson's story's feat of herding Texas cattle north into Montana through central Wyoming was not to be repeated for more than a decade. However, pioneering Wyoming cattlemen began stocking the area south of the North Platte with Texas Longhorns. These animals were the vanguard of the Texas herds that would eventually stock the prairies all the way north into Canada. But the Indian presence north of the North Platte would almost completely stop the Longhorns' northward progress through the 1870s. Although a few herds of Texas cattle would be driven into Montana by a route west along uh, parallel to the Emigrant Road, and then north through central Idaho along about the route of today's Interstate 15 to enter Montana territory through its southwestern valleys. The precipitous decline of the Montana Gold Rush at the end of the 1860s left Montana stockmen with a diminished local market. <coughs> But fortunately, the completion of the first transcontinental railroad across southern Wyoming and northern Utah in 1869 made it possible for the first time for the cattlemen of Montana Territory to ship their cattle to Midwestern markets by rail. Unfortunately, <coughs> rail transport was expensive. To save paying for railroad mileage, Montana cattlemen began herding their cattle to railheads in southeast Wyoming or even western Nebraska by an indirect route south through what is now eastern Idaho and then east along routes parallel to the Emigrant Road. Herding by a more direct route southeast across the prairies of Montana and Wyoming was not possible. And because, as I previously mentioned, these prairies were frequented by several tribes of Indians, and besides, northeastern Wyoming was closed to non-Indians by the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868. At about the same time as the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, Montana stockmen such as Bob Ford, Dan Flowery, and Conrad Kors began pasturing herds of their cattle in the Sun River Valley along the western edge of the Great Plains. That's a due west of where Great Falls is now. <coughs> After the January 1870 Baker Massacre broke the military will of the Pegan Blackfeet, Montana cattlemen began stocking other prairie river valleys close to the Rocky Mountains. Most of their cattle they herded out from the western valleys and onto the edge of the prairie were largely English-American bloodlines. But there were also herds of Texas Longhorns, which Bob Ford and Dan Flowery had brought into the southwestern valleys in the late 1860s by that long route north through eastern Idaho. Into the late 1870s, cattle raising in Montana was limited to the western valleys and to the western edge of the prairies of the territory. The eastern prairies were home to free-roaming Indians. <coughs> 
and to hundreds of thousands of buffalo that the Indians depend upon for their survival. There was still no convenience access to rail transport, but these impediments to cattle ranching in the eastern reaches of the territory were about to be removed. The military defeat of the Sioux and Cheyenne in the winter of 1877 and their subsequent relocation to reservations or flight to Canada cleared the way for herds of Texas Longhorns to be driven north across Wyoming and directly into eastern Montana. In his 1940 book, The Longhorns, eminent Texas historian J. Frank Doby described the Longhorn cattle that the Texans herded. These cattle had heavy fore and light hind quarters, thick necks, large coarse heads, and unusually long sharp horns. They were very light bodied and quick and agile on foot. They were products of a land where forage was not especially abundant. Hardiness, a fighting maternal instinct, and ability to thrive under primitive conditions were their chief recommendations. However he might appear with his steel hooves, his long legs, his stag-like muscles, his thick skin, his mighty horns, the long horn could walk the roughest ground, climb the highest hill, swim the widest river, fight the fiercest panther. He was the cow brute for his time. When the first Texas herds arrived from the south in 1879, there were still thousands of buffalo roaming eastern Montana. But the removal of the Indians had made it safe for the hide hunters to begin their bloody work, and soon the buffalo were almost completely gone. Grenville Stewart served in the 1880s as the part owner and then the foreman of the DHS ranch in central Montana. He described in his autobiography the drastic changes on the Montana range in the early 1880s. He said, in 1880, the country was practically uninhabited. One could travel for miles without seeing so much as a trapper's bivouac. Thousands of buffalo darkened the rolling plains. There were deer, antelope, elk, wolves, and coyotes on every hill and in every ravine and thicket. In the whole territory of Montana, there were but 250,000 head of cattle, including dairy cattle and work oxen. And then he goes on. In the fall of 1883, there was not one buffalo remaining on the range, and the antelope, elk, and deer were indeed scarce, and there were 600,000 head of cattle on the range. That's in 1883, 600,000 cattle in Montana. Construction of the Northern Pacific Railroad was advancing up the Yellowstone Valley by 1881, and railheads for loading and unloading cattle were built at strategic points along the way. The completion of the Northern Pacific in 1883 made it possible for the first time for the eastern Montana stockmen to easily ship cattle from the range to Midwestern packing plants, and also for him to receive cattle shipped to him from points both east and west. During the early 1880s, in the rush to fill the newly opened ranges of eastern Montana, hundreds of herds of Texas Longhorns poured in from the south while well, tens of thousands of Oregon cattle were herded in and were transported by rail from the west, thousands of purebred Midwestern cattle rode the rails into the territory from the east. I think it's worth noting here that bulls being bulls, these types of cattle did not stay distinct for long once they were turned onto the open range and that over several generations a hodgepodge mix called simply range cattle resulted. With the stocking of the ranges of eastern Montana came the full-scale use of the open range system, which had originated in Mexico and had then been refined in Texas. As millions of Longhorn cattle were herded north out of Texas after the Civil War to stock the western Great Plains, the open range system had been adopted as a means of managing them. Now, very simply put, 
Under the open range system, cattle were first branded to show ownership and then released onto a range of public domain land, which was usually defined by drainage boundaries. Cattle of several owners mixed together on the range so that each year several cooperative roundups were staged to sort out the cattle. The spring roundup was held to establish ownership of the year's calves, which was evidenced because they were still at their mother's side and then to brand them. While the fall beef roundup picked out mature animals to be sent to market. In the fall of 1883, it was generally recognized by veteran Montana cattlemen that the prairies were fully stocked with 600,000 head of cattle in Montana. Yet three years later, in the fall of 1886, there were, again by Granville Stewart's estimate, some one million cattle in the territory, and more herds continued to pour in. Common sense had become a victim of the beef boom, or beef bonanza, as it was sometimes called. Part of the genesis of the beef boom was that during the 1860s, the number of cattle in the United States exclusive of its territories, had declined in proportion to the U.S. population. This resulted in a sharp rise in the price of beef, and thus creating a demand for cheaper beef. Raising cattle on the public domain in the western prairies, newly emptied of buffalo and of Indians, offered the perfect solution to high-priced beef. Enterprising cattlemen soon figured out that they could acquire cattle from Texas or from Oregon for almost nothing, raise them on the public land of the western ranges with only minimal expenses, such as for a ranch house, a branding iron, some corrals, and a few cowboys. The meat packing plants of Kansas City, Omaha, Chicago, and St. Paul did their part, and the nation's expanded network of railroads was there to transport live cattle from the range to the packing plants, and also using their newfangled refrigerated cars to deliver packed fresh beef from the Midwestern plants to retailers all over the eastern U.S. And periodicals and books got in on the act, too. Here's what the Denver Journal of Commerce had to say in 1883. A good-sized steer, when it is fit for the butcher market, will bring 40 to $60. The same animal at its birth was worth but five dollars. He has run on the plains and cropped the grass from the public domain for four or five years and now, with scarcely any expense to his owner, is worth forty dollars more than when he started on his pilgrimage. A thousand of these animals are kept nearly as cheaply as a single one. I, I like that. And, so that with a thousand as a starter, and with an investment of about five thousand dollars in the start, in four years the stock raiser has made from forty to forty-five thousand dollars. So if my math is right, that's about a two hundred percent annual estimated profit on investment. Published in 1881, the book *The Beef Bonanza* or *How to Get Rich on the Plains* did much to promote open-range cattle raising. The Beef Bonanza's author, James Brisbane, had served as a career army officer at several western posts. The service had given him a chance to observe and study stock raising in the west. In his book, he extolled the promise of large profits, almost guaranteed from raising cattle on the plains. He advised his readers that there is little difference between the climate of the plains and the Atlantic coast. I like that one, too. <laughs> in his book, Brisbane cited estimates of annual profits on capital invested as high as 50 to 55 percent. The beef bonanza reads like a prospectus for an open-range cattle raising business, and indeed, Brisbane himself speculated in the Montana cattle industry. So with periodicals and books forecasting spectacular profits from stock raising on the western public domain, the beef boom started because investors in Scotland, England, France, and the eastern United States wanted in on the spectacular profits, and they poured in their investment money. In Wyoming, a corporate syndicate formed in Scotland started the Swan Land and Cattle Company, which ultimately ran 120,000 cattle. In 
In Montana, the pattern was for outside money to go into cattle companies that already existed or were moving into Montana from the outside. In 1882, financed substantially by borrowed money, the Niobrara Cattle Company began expanding its operation from Texas and Nebraska into eastern Montana. Because it was almost impossible to count the actual number of animals in a herd spread over hundreds of square miles of open range and mixed in with animals belonging to others, it was common during the beef boom for herds of cattle to be bought and sold on book count. And book count was calculated by starting with the number of animals that had been purchased, which was perhaps wildly overstated because it was also based on a book count. Adding the total number of calves branded in the spring roundup to this count and decreasing the count by an estimated factor of loss from winter mortality, predation, and other causes such as miring and eating poisonous plants. It was widely recognized that book counts were almost always overstated, but during the beef boom, these overestimated counts were thought to be inconsequential because of the huge profits to be made in spite of the buying and selling of cattle that didn't exist. John Clay, who had served in Wyoming as an overseer and ranch manager for a Scottish corporation, had this to say about the use of book count in buying range cattle. It was a gamble in which the dealer almost won. Almost, no, he almost always won. <laughs> Excuse me. You can sometimes win at Faro, often rake in shekels at Monte Carlo, speculate on the stock exchange, bet on a horse race, and get your money back and more. But on book count deal in cattle has always proved disastrous. The owner of a Montana cattle company who received outside investors' money became obligated to those investors to produce as much profit as possible, no matter what the consequences to the land or to the animals on it. Even though this might require keeping a herd on a range that was in poor condition, and could not possibly humanely support those cattle. Clearly, the thinking of those running cattle on the Montana prairies was short-term, though the periodicals and books of the time claimed that the beef boom could go on indefinitely. There was simply no effective government or private mechanism to regulate the number of animals on any range. The boom years of the open range cattle industry were from 1880 through 1885. But by the end of the hot, dry summer of 1886, the grass on most of the Montana ranges had been destroyed by the harsh weather and by prolonged overgrazing. The survival of the open range cattle through the winter depended on there being adequate, nutritious, cured grass left on the range so that the cattle could rustle that is, to actively search out and consume this cured grass. The dire situation was compounded by low cattle market prices, so that many stockmen decided to hold more animals over the winter, hoping for a better price the next year, rather than shipping them after the fall beef roundup. The demand on the range was also increased by the presence of more than a million sheep. And because of the dry summer, range fires consume precious grass, often the very best. Despite overcrowding on the ranges, in the summer of 1886, Montana stockmen continued to bring in tens of thousands more cattle. More cautious Montana cattlemen looked for ways to remove their valuable stock from the depleted ranges of the public domain. Some leased large tracts of grazing land from the Alberta provincial government and tens of thousands of range cattle were driven north. High quality range on the large Indian reservation north of the Missouri River and on the Crow Reservation was open to some stockmen by the United States federal government. In September, the Helena Independent reported, it is doubtful if the total precipitation, snow and rain has averaged two inches over the whole territory during the past months. The consequence was a season of unprecedented heat and one marked by low streams and lack of irrigating water. All over the territory, the same cry has gone up. The grass on the ranges grew but slimly and cured before its time for lack of moisture. Much 
depends upon the coming winter. In the fall of 1886, Teddy Blue Abbott was a cowboy working to move cattle of the DHS outfit from overgrazed range in central Montana to nearly pristine range on reservation land north of the Missouri River. Fifty years later, he told about what happened that fall and winter of 1886-87. The summer had been very dry, as what grass we had was eaten off before the first snow fell. In November, we had several snowstorms, and I saw the first white owls I have ever seen. The Indians said they were a bad sign. Heap snow coming. Very cold. They sure hit it right. We had two weeks of nice weather just before Christmas, but on Christmas Eve, it started to storm and never really let up for 60 days. It got colder and colder. The latter part of January, it started a Chinook just enough to melt the snow on top. But it turned cold, and on February 3rd and 4th, the worst blizzard I ever saw set in. The snow crusted, and was hell without the heat. I wrote to Granville Stewart telling him I thought the loss would not be over 10%. In 10 days, I know it was 75%. So when the weather finally broke in early March, it was too late to save the open-range cattle. Coolies were filled with animals that had moved into them seeking shelter and had gone no farther. Barbed wire fences stretching across the paths of storm-drifting cattle proved to be death traps. The spring roundups of 1887 showed that the actual loss of cattle surpassed the most pessimistic estimates. Losses varied by region, with reported cases of mortality of up to 90% on the Yellowstone. Conrad Kors believed the average loss on the prairies of the Eastern Territory was, it was actually about 50%. In the sheltered Western Valleys, the losses were much less. Different classes of animals survived at different rates. It was found that Texas steers had spent several previous winters on the Montana ranges had the best survival rate of all classes of cattle. The Oregon cattle had been brought in from an area that had cold winters, but there were many cows and calves among them which did not survive well, so mortality was high overall. Granville Stewart estimated a 66% loss for DHS herds, which were substantially all Oregon cattle. The purebred cattle, that had been shipped in from the Midwest on the railroad and turned loose on the range were almost a total loss because of their tendency to hang around the ranch buildings and wait to be fed instead of rustling for grass on the range. Milk cows and bulls did not survive well either. Although Chicago prices were still low, many Montana cattle outfits seeking to blunt the financial impact of the disaster shipped every marketable animal but the receipts were not enough to meet their financial obligations. European and Eastern investors, suddenly aware that the beef boom could go bust with one terrible winter, withdrew what was left of their investments. Many cattle companies went out of business. The huge Swan Land and Cattle Company in Wyoming failed. The Niobrara Cattle Company, which had borrowed extensively to expand its operations, went bankrupt and was sold. As the cattle companies lost their outside cattle, let me try that again. As the cattle companies lost their outside capital or failed completely, cattle company owners who had fretted nervously for years about how they could ever reconcile the inflated book counts to the actual number of cattle in their herds were provided with a sort of grim golden opportunity. They could simply write off to mortality all the non-existent animals in their book counts and thus reconcile their book counts to reality. Despite the disaster, the hard winter created opportunities for those who would seize them. The water from the melting winter snow and from adequate spring rains rejuvenated the range and the grass came back. The deaths of hundreds of thousands of cattle had eliminated the, the problem of overgrazing. For those who would buy cattle, there were thousands for sale at bargain prices from companies that were folding. 
and Conrad Kors and Pierre Weibo reestablished their herds in this manner. Now, it's surprising that by the end of the 1880s, there were as many cattle in Montana as there had been just before the hard winter. Herds of longhorn steers were brought in from Texas by rail and trail into the 20th century. Purebred stock cattle came by rail from the Midwest. The Columbia Basin, however, contributed little to the restocking of the Montana range as its huge reserve of cattle had been exhausted. But of the cattle companies that stayed in business, there were two basic types. Some chose to continue running longhorn steers on the open range because these steers had survived well in the hard winter. These open range Texas steer operations continued in eastern Montana until after 1910, when competition from incoming homesteaders claiming pieces of the public domain finally forced them to quit. The other type of cattle operation in the years after the hard winter was a smaller outfit operating on mostly privately held fenced land. These small stockmen bred and raised purebred cattle, typically shorthorns at first, and these are shorthorns, which they replaced with Herefords in later years. And in the 20th century, Black Angus cattle became dominant, as we all are aware. Although purebred animals had not survived the hard winter well, they dressed out to yield more and better quality beef. In the case of the Herefords, they were ready for market at an earlier age. The small operators grew irrigated native hay and put it up for winter feeding. And later, non-native forage plants such as red top, timothy, clover, and alfalfa were introduced. Prior to the hard winter, it was common for cattlemen to harvest native grass hay to feed to their horses during the winters. During the open range years, almost no one put up hay for his cattle, and with them spread over hundreds of square miles, it would have been impossible to feed them during the winter anyway. Even in mild winters, open range cattle had suffered a type of slow starvation. At first, the small stockmen typically pastured their animals on the open range in the summer and brought them into fence pastures to be fed during the winter. In later years, their stock was kept in fence pastures year-round. And it was from these small stockmen that the modern Montana cattle industry evolved. It's remarkable to me that in the 1880s, with most of eastern Montana and open range, the country was overgrazed with only a million cattle feeding on it. While today, there are more than two and a half million cattle in the state of Montana. It's the cultivation and storage of high quality hay that's made this miracle possible. Today, cattle raising is an important Montana industry with yearly receipts of, by one estimate, some $1.5 billion. From the perspective of today, we can see that the cattle boom and the hard winter were not the beginning of the end for the Montana cattle industry, but rather the beginning of its future. Thank you. So we're recording these, um, we're live streaming these programs and they're um, on YouTube channel afterwards as well. So I'm going to repeat the question. If anybody has questions, we have time, and I'm sure Vicky Vic has the answers. So um, oh no, yeah. <laughs> I'll yes, try. Marco. Where did, the, uh, Texas longhorns come from? Where did oh they were Spanish? Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Where That's did the Texas again. longhorns originate? They were uh, brought in from the Spanish. They were like they were from the Iberian Peninsula originally, and, and brought in by the um, the conquistadori type folks. Well, not by the conquistadores, but at that time. Yeah. I was just wondering if, you, if the trails that were used, you know, the, the ones that the, the cattle drives you hear about primarily are the ones like Lonesome Dove. You know. In the 1880s, probably the early 1880s, and coming up, maybe the Goodnight Trail or you know, some of the trails from Texas. Were, were there any particular ones that 
So the question regards what, um, which trails were used the most? Uh, things like the Good Night Trail coming in from Texas. Well, Teddy Blue Abbott talked about the Western Trail, which was cobbled together out of pre-existing trails and came kind of up the uh, face of the Rockies uh, all the way into Montana and even into, into Canada. The, the, it's more of a subject than I can go into right now. Other questions? Yes, sir. Do you have any sense of the uh, profitability of current BKSA? Profitability of current, the current beef industry. Well, I think it fluctuates with the price of beef. You mean right now? I, I haven't been following it right now. It was down, down and then back up, and uh, I don't know where it is right well, now. What kind of range? Oh, I don't, I don't have the answer to that. I'm sorry. Other questions? Comments? Jennifer. Vic, how are you enjoying your retirement? <laughs> how, how is Vic enjoying his retirement? Well, I, that's a very good question. Um, it's been great so far. I learned how to, uh, to uh, mechanic harmonicas. And you know what? It takes all my time. So. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Um, that was a comment about Bob Brown's uncle who rode with Teddy Blue Abbott and what a, a source of pride that was for him. The question is, what size of crew did you need for a large cattle drive? Was there a ratio between the number of men and the number of cattle? Yes, uh, Teddy, Teddy Blue said it took 11 men to move a herd of about 2,000 cattle. Uh, that was eight men to handle the herd itself, the cook, the horse wrangler, and the boss. <laughs> And of those, the cook was the most important. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, did, they, did those herds usually, they usually had two wagons with them, didn't they? A uh, uh, cook wagon uh, and, a, and a bed wagon as well? Was, was the bed wagon part of the after thing here in Montana, I guess? The question is, did they have, did a, tra a cattle trail drive have two wagons a cook wagon and a bed wagon. Well, I know the Roundups had two wagons. The one for the bed rolls, they, they called a hoodlum. And, uh, uh, you know, I haven't come across that in reading about trail drives, but that, uh, that doesn't mean it's not possible. Were there any women in the business? Well, I don't know if I want to go there. <laughs> there, there, were, there, were, there were definitely women uh, that helped out the cowboys, <laughs> according to Teddy Blue. <laughs> I, I, I haven't read about any women on a trail drive. Or, uh, I'm sure there are women that work on roundups today and moving cattle today. Any other questions or comments? All right, well, Vic, thank you very much.